Hi, everyone. This week, we are reading chapters one through four of Origin of Species. And I've chosen these chapters because they lay out in as clear a fashion as is possible Darwin's central idea of natural selection, which or what we think of as evolution. Um, it's a lengthy reading assignment, but I think it's good to get the kind of sweep of his argument. And that's why I've assigned chapters one through four for this week. And that's what we'll discuss on Friday. What we didn't talk about last week was the portion of the voyage of the Beagle where he goes to the Galapagos Islands. And I thought I'd start the lecture for um, this week on that section. This is on page three, it starts on um, uh, page 384 of our book, our textbook, and he arrives at the Galapagos Islands, which is a chain of islands about 600 miles west of Ecuador, and it's part of the nation of Ecuador today. And if there's any kind of sacred space for the narrative, the story of evolution, it would have to be the Galapagos Island. As you all know, I would argue that Tierra del Fuego and his um, encounter with human beings uh, at the tip of South America should be also a second um, site for that kind of uh, uh, his realization of his big his life's project. But Galapagos Island, um, these this chain of islands turned out to have many creatures that were utterly unique and stunning, frankly, to Darwin. Um, and in his chapter on this, uh, he writes about what he saw and what he felt. And he writes, the natural history of these islands is eminently curious and well deserves attention. Most of the organic productions are aboriginal creations found nowhere else, right? So he's stunned at the, the uniqueness of the creatures that he's seeing. And if you've watched, um, uh, you know, BBC documentary specials, you'll see things on, docu on the Galapagos Islands with those, the large tortoises and the seagoing lizards. They're just creatures that, that seem to fill roles that they don't anywhere else in the world. There's even a difference between the inhabitants of the different islands, yet all show a marked relationship with those of America, though separated from that continent by an open space of ocean. The archipelago is a little world within itself, or rather a satellite attached to America. So you can see his mind kind of working on what explains this place and the uniqueness of the creatures that I find here. Um, and he goes on, and here you see the real hints towards origin of species. Hence, both in time, in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhat near to the great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. So that is what he's going to identify um, as what origin of species is about, is like, where do species come from? Were they... Um, acts of individual creation by a god, which was the dominant story of his day. Every unique species was a creation of God. Um, or is there some other way to account for the appearance of species? And the Galapagos, as he calls it a world in itself, seems to have be the home for all these different species that are nowhere else. So is this an original site of creation? Um, did God kind of reach down and create these species here? That seems like an odd story because it's volcanic. These are volcanic islands, so it's not like they've been around forever. You can see that they are um, uh, much younger than other parts of the earth. Um, and so maybe there's another story that you could tell to explain these unique creatures here on the Galapagos. Now, this is in this chapter, he goes on to talk about several examples that are going to become kind of canonical examples of evolution. The Beak of the Finch. It used to be a freshman studies book, in fact, called The Beak of the Finch. Um, and it's Darwin's noticing about the finches in different parts of these islands filling different roles, um, have different size beaks for their kind of particular niche or job that they're doing. Um, so he'll discuss that. He's going to discuss the tortoises. And then he learns that there's very subtle differences, but you can understand what island, which tortoise is from based on small differences in the shell. Um, and those are things that Darwin realizes um, uh, must be things that evolved over time to meet its in, in their environment. 
Um, I think it's sometimes we think of uh, advances like the theory of evolution as these light bulb moments, and that's not the case at all. Um, what we should imagine and what Darwin explains is that he's in the Galapagos and he's collecting species as usual. Um, but in fact, he's he doesn't recognize the fact that there are these differences from island to island um, until he gets back and starts looking at his collection. Or, and even while he's there, uh, he realizes the, that, there, that there are differences. So in this chapter on the Galapagos Islands, he's talking about you know, he kind of mixed his collection of finches together, not knowing that there would be such differences even among close islands. Um, and he has to kind of try to sort them out later. So what you see um, is that it's not like Darwin reaches the Galapagos, sees these creatures and gets a light bulb in his head, but he makes collections. And then over time, over several years, he's examining those collections, talking to people and realizing that there's a great significance in the differences that he's seeing. Um, in this chapter, he also speaks of something that he calls a creative force. Um, reviewing the facts here given about the Galapagos Islands and all the different creatures there, one is astonished at the amount of creative force, if such an expression may be used, displayed on these small, barren, and rocky islands. And I would suggest that this is an example of what he's going to eventually call natural selection that there's something driving variation and the development of species. And these Galapagos Islands is this kind of, um, for reasons that he's gonna try to speculate about later, is this place of uh, uh, great creative force. And, and I just, you know, the, some of the religious overtones of what Darwin is, the way he speaks and the way he talks about natural selection and the created and the natural world, is clear in that kind of a phrase. Um, he's interested in finding what is the creative force that would drive such amazing diversity in a place like the Galapagos Islands. And Origin of Species is gonna be the book that really kind of gets at um, what he means by that. Now, Origin of Species. So the um, he's, he's back from the Beagle in 1837, 1836, 1837. And he's already going to be thinking about the ideas that lead to the origin of species. But there's going to be 25 years between returning and the publication of Origin of Species in 1859. He's going to sit on these ideas and develop them for a long time. And Origin of Species, the book, really reflects that 25 years of pondering and thinking and collecting information. Now, already in 1837, in one of his notebooks, he's going to sketch out a tree and then write the words, I think, over it. Meaning you can see that he's seeing that life can be understood as this branching development. One thing leading to another, branching, leading to different things, and that that's what explains the mystery of mysteries, the creation of unique species. So that's 1837. Then he's gonna be kind of collecting information. Um, and that's though is going to reach a point of crisis in 1858 when he receives a paper from a, another explorer scientist, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, who's out in the uh, what, what is today Indonesia and comes up with a very similar theory that Darwin has been sitting on about the development of species. Okay, that's 1858. Now Darwin is going to get a hold, get a hold of this paper and then worry. He's been, his whole big idea is going to be preceded by somebody else. So he proposes that they both present jointly a paper on their theory um, uh, at the um, relevant gathering, scientific gathering. So officially for natural selection and evolution, there are kind of co-discoverers of this principle, which is Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. And they both present papers. And you can read those papers. All this stuff is collected, for example, in this book, um, uh, uh, it's a place where you can see the um, the thoughts of these two people in this early stage. Now, the thing is, is that's going to get Darwin kind of a fire underneath him uh, to write uh, to write up his theory in a complete way. And so that will be um, uh, the development of the origin of species. And that really lends a unique feel to the origin of species. It's a book written at speed. Right, he's got all these ideas he's been sitting on. He's like, "Oh crap! Now I'm I'm gonna look like I'm kind of 
the second person. And so he's writing quickly to get this out. And he, that ends up with a very effective book. So it's a book that has this kind of narrative push to it. Believe it or not, you're going to get bogged down when, in maybe the first chapter. But as you get into it, you'll see there's a narrative push and an argument that really stands out. And Origin will be published in 1859. All right. Um, now, a couple things to think about as you're reading uh, The Origin of Species. First of all, it is something of a Victorian novel, right? If you think about great Victorian novels, Dickens, George Eliot, what have you, they can be these sprawling books. And in fact, they're kind of in danger of falling into chaos at times. There's so many characters, there's so many developments. Um, they're like a Netflix series, basically, you know, that people would would binge on as as the new installment comes out, and and the they are controlled. Uh, you know, you can lose the big picture for all these kind of small plot developments. And Darwin's Origin of Species, many people have compared to like a sprawling Victorian novel. And the challenge in reading it is to kind of he's got he's kind of taking, marshalling all these facts that he's gathered and bringing them to bear on this argument. But it is a sprawling set of facts that he has. Now, it's not technical. It's not like he's citing, you know, this journal and that journal. It's not kind of scientific writing as we're used to it. It's more like a novelist. And it, he is bringing this massive project to us and landing it. And that is a kind of a tour de force in and of itself. But you got to kind of approach it like a Victorian novel. Um, another thing is he's right. He's correct in this idea of natural selection and evolution, but he doesn't, he's missing some key facts. One thing he doesn't know anything about is genetics. So he's gonna talk about heredity and the way there's kind of a passing down of characteristics from parent to child. Um, and that's a key part of his argument. But remember, he knows nothing about genetics and DNA. Um, Unfortunately, he doesn't know about Mendel and his uh, at the kind of concurrent um, work on uh, bean plants and and variation in genes that would have helped him a lot. But he doesn't know about that yet. So he gets it right, but he has to often kind of um, make reference to these vague ideas of hereditary principles and things that he he knows are happening, but he can't explain. And that's something that's amazing to me as I read this, is just to think about how much he's kind of guessing at and intuiting, but doesn't know yet. And yet this is a, this is a, um, a book that, you know, sure you can, you can change things and critique things on the margin, but in its big picture is what you learn in um, uh, natural science classes today. Um, the other thing is the spiritual side. Remember Darwin on those trip, uh, around the Beagle has Paradise Lost by John Milton uh, on the boat. And um, he's he's he knows the religious uh, stakes in writing about the origin of species. That This is kind of a rewriting of Genesis. And that's something I'd like you to look for. And we'll deal with that a little bit more next week. But even now, to what extent is this a replacement scripture? To what extent does he kind of seem to realize the religious and spiritual stakes and write like there are that like those stakes exist. See if you can spot that kind of thing. Now, what I want you to do for Friday is just to read the chapters one to four. See if you can grasp the 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 argument in its sweep, and that's what we'll, we're going to review that, and then land on um, uh, something about a, a first impression or something. Um, that surprised you in the text. And I'd like to hear from everybody something that was interesting or that surprised them. All right. So I'll, in our Zoom meeting, I'll kind of be talking, be asking you to, to talk about what you saw there, even as we're kind of trying to establish the sweep of this story. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow. Um, I look forward to our talk about what I think is one of the great books of human history. And certainly at the, at the ground level, of this idea of dark green religion. All right, talk to you tomorrow.